Freedom Fail. We'd like to take you on a visit to a town that doesn't exist. A town we call Springfield, USA. We'd like to show you how things would be in any American town if communism took over. This is the story of what would happen to the little fellow, the average citizen like you and the man next door. Sapphire Anniversary. Kate, I said, don't huh? move. My doctor, unless you want burned toast for breakfast. Oh, Kate, standing by the window with the sun in your hair, making it like silver. Well, it was downright beautiful, oh, and I... Son of old springtime blarney, aren't you? Ought to be ashamed the man is almost 70 acting like a kid. Well, maybe I feel like a kid. It's likely when a man's got a wife who looks prettier than the day he married her <laughs> 45 years ago, come a week from Tuesday. No. The talented woman who makes the best popovers this side of the Rockies. So that's it. I didn't tape her off on the poetry because there wasn't enough flour for popovers this morning. Now you have to settle for eggs and plain old toast. Go on, sit down. Okay. But I meant what I said. I can prove it. I remembered her anniversary. Oh, say, how's the coffee supply holding out? I guess we can manage a second cup for you this morning. No, no, no thanks. You better save it for George Morrow. He'll be along soon. Hey, that venison George gave us, how much have we got left? Enough for a couple of weeks. Good. You think we could feed three or four extra for one meal on a certain day come a week from Tuesday? We'll manage it. I'll be very careful. Even if we have to eat a little less afterwards. It'll, it'll be worth it. Yes. We'll write John. See if we can bring Viola and little Johnny for the day. You think we can feed George, too? <laughs> I think so. Oh. Is that you, George? Yeah, nobody else. Well, come on in. Come in. Yeah. Looks like I might be in time for a cup of coffee, yeah, huh? Yeah, you are. What you got in that sack? Mm, flour. It's for you. Don't ask me where I got it. Oh, George, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I always thought Santa Claus was an old fellow with white whiskers. But you, you, you shaved this morning. George Murr, you can use that flour as much as we can. Yeah, but you can't make popovers with it. Mm, turn about fair play. Give me half a dozen eggs every couple of weeks. Besides, we all got sick together these days. If we don't, we're, well, we're just as good as dead. George, what a way to talk. What other way is there? Say, uh, did you hear about Gerald Hawkins? Hmm? Well, I know he went to Springfield uh, three weeks ago. Is he back? No, never will be. He died in Springfield. Auto accident, they say. But, you know, I figured that he was murdered. You... Why, who's murdered Joel? Everybody liked him. Oh, does a man walk off and leave the best thousand acres of farm in the state, stocked and equipped and unattended, all ready for the commies to move in and turn it into one of those, uh, those, oh, what do you call them now? Oh, yes, the state farm? Well, maybe it was an accident, George. Not when Conway takes it over the day before. The I don't want to talk about it. I won't believe it's as bad as George keeps saying. Oh, now, there's no need to get worked up, Kate. I was uh, just passing on the news. With your own pessimistic slant. Everybody knows it's too bad the commies got control of the country. And so far, they haven't touched anyone but the big people, people like senators and governors and judges. Oh, they'll get around everybody in due time. Well, you make it sound horrible, like they were out to kill everyone. Well, it is horrible, I know. Well, maybe. But what about John? He works for them in Springfield and manages to stay happy and raise his family. Mm, family? Well, maybe that's the reason. <laughs> Prince Blackie, he's waiting for his morning handout, Dan. There's no sugar there. You can get him a carrot or you'll find turnips in the bin. There you are, there you are, Blackie, old boy. Chop it down. Okay, now, now go on back to the field. I'll be out soon. 
So I get it. You think it's time we got to work, huh? Now, don't overdo, will you, Nan? Uh, Blackie won't let me. I don't run this place. He does. Tells me when to go to work and when to kit. Well, be sure and turn on the radio, Kate. Catch the news for me. George Morrow, I can break your neck. I could almost tell you to get out and take your flower with you. Mm-hmm. What I do? What you do? I mean, nothing. Nothing at all. You just changed Dan from a happy, young-hearted man into a heavy-footed old man. Aged him 20 years in just about two minutes. But I don't get it. Dan's old enough to know the score. All his life, he's kept up on things. Why, why you ought to hear what I heard on the radio this morning. Uh, maybe you can if we missed part of the 9 o'clock news, but turn it on anyhow. Mm-hmm. Dan asked me to listen to it. Well, there ought to be enough news left to give one here for us. The effect that all farmers are cautioned to familiarize themselves with the new regulations. Comrade Kalinsky said that the unfilled quotas for grain, dairy products, and meats were due to a holdover of wasteful and inefficient capitalistic methods of agriculture. Collectivism and state-operated farms will be increased rapidly, with a prime objective, the elimination of the shameful Kular class. Of the Nisbet speaking, this is the People's News Service. Okay, you see, you see, that's only a sample. First part of it was all about another purge of reactionaries for the great glory of the state. George, I don't care. Dan isn't going to be touched by it, and neither am I. Well, now you can't isolate a man like Dan. It'd be like trying to keep Blackie in a three by five corral. Dan likes to know what's going on. There must be some way. There has to be. Hmm. Kate. Kate, what are you trying to do there? Trying to wreck it? There. Looks fine, don't it? Looks the same as before. Except when you turn it on, nothing happens. Nothing. <laughs> and that's what Blackie did. Kate, that horse is practically human. Next to you is the most important member of this household. He's a friend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's as good a friend as George Morrow. Well, he's cheered you up. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs> Speaking of George, Dan, you mustn't take everything he says seriously. He always is looking on the dark side of everything. Well, let's forget it for now. Huh? Uh, did you catch the news for me? I tried, but uh, radio's gone dead. Dead? Well, let me have a look at it. Mm. Yeah. Well, it looks all right. Wires are okay. Oh, here. Here's the trouble, I think. Yup, yeah, the power tube is missing. Now, who do you suppose took that tube? Well, it was burned out. I hope you remember the size, because I guess I got disgusted and just threw it away. And here we are, miles and miles from town, no way of knowing what goes on. Well, Blackie and I better get up early tomorrow and ride into Springfield. Fifty miles for that? Oh, well, why don't you wait till somebody with a car goes in? Oh, no, no, no. I've got it. I have to write to John and get the letter down to the crossroads before night. He can bring a tube along when he comes. Dear John, I hope this finds you, Viola, and Johnny happy and in good health. You'll have to excuse me for not writing sooner, but since the state suspended our insurance payments, the past few months have been very rough. We've had a big readjustment to make, but I'm glad to say we've made it. I guess you'd call it a shaky sort of economy, since it depends on the strength and intelligence of an animal, but when you figure this animal is a certain horse named Blackie, and it doesn't seem so risky. It sounds a little frightening to me, John. Hmm? You mean they actually depend on that horse? Well, honey, there's no choice for Dad. He and Mom have to grow their own food, otherwise they wouldn't eat. Dad's not strong enough for heavy work like plowing and cultivating and hauling, but Blackie is, and that's the economy he's talking about. Hmm. Still frightens me. Well, go on, go on, read the rest yeah. of it. A week from Tuesday, your mother and I celebrate 45 years of marriage. A sapphire anniversary. While we don't expect you to bring us a pocket full of star sapphires, we would like you, Viola, and Johnny for the day. A country year will do you all good, and it'll mean everything to us to have the family gathered around the same table once more. 
When you come, please bring along a power tube for the old radio. We need it desperately because radios are only contact with the outside world. Unless you count the news that filters forth hand through George George Morrow. <laughs> Thank you, and don't disappoint us. Love, Dad. Mm. Well, Vi, this time we won't disappoint him. I worked right through the last two weekends, finishing those new traffic schedules, and the boss is pleased enough to let me have a free day. Well, it, it's sweet of Dan to ask, but Johnny and I can't go. Can't go? Why not? Because next Tuesday, Johnny's been invited to join the youth group, that great new organization that replaced that capitalistic Boy Scouts with all the softness and decadence of scouting eliminated, of course, and Johnny had better be there on time, together with one of his parents. On time, so they can start taking all the humanity out of him. Yeah. You know, he's going to wonder about parents who are two-faced enough to give lip service to one thing and preach another. Oh, no, honey, look, there's nothing disgraceful or two-faced in, in teaching him enough deception to stay alive. We can give him ideals to keep silently in front of himself. So if the chance ever comes, he'll want to free himself. Oh, I guess so. I hope so. But in the meantime, instead of being out in the country with his grandfather, he'll be here with... Look, Vi, honey, if it'll help any, I'll write Dad and arrange a later date for us all. And I'll go with you to this youth group business. We'll get it oh, over. Oh, no, no. I can manage it. I, I'm sorry I spilled over. Oh. Why shouldn't you? After once in a while. John, I, I want you to go to Kate and Dan. It's their anniversary, and, and one of us really ought to be there. Yeah, but my place is here with you. Oh, yes, but... Well, they're getting older, and well, who knows, this may be your last chance to see them. Later, if we're lucky, all three of us can go and have a holiday in the country. Yeah, if we're lucky. You write, Dan, tonight. Tell him you'll be there. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, that radio tube he wants, well, I'm a little worried about that. Remember the time we had getting a couple of tubes for our radio? You'd think they were solid gold. Well, at least give it a try. That is, if you won't get in trouble. Comrade Ward, uh, if it's too much to ask, just forget. Uh, you say a radio is a necessity for these parents of yours, Comrade Blackett. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You see, they live 50 miles from town up near the foothills. They're old. Got no car, of course. Mm -hmm. And the radio is their only means of knowing what goes on. And uh, this particular radio uses a number 6X 5G power tube. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is your father's occupation, Comrade? Oh, I, I guess you'd say he was retired. He used to be a lot Retired? I'm afraid that'll go against him on the application. He has no work of any kind at the present time. Well, he does farm his place. His place. He farms it. I suppose you fill out this form and we'll send it through. Uh, be sure to identify him as a farmer and uh, answer all the questions. Yes. Uh, how long do you think it'll take before I can get the tube? I'm right, Proctor. I can give absolutely no assurances as to that. Your request may or may not be approved. However... We should know that within a couple of days. A couple of days only because of your good record with the traffic bureau, you understand? Oh, yes, yes, comrade. And I'm grateful to you. I've checked these applications, Harry, and they seem regular enough. We can send them on. How many times do I have to tell you not to call me Harry around the office? It's Comrade Hollenbeck. And don't forget it. Mm. All right, Harry. All right. Not so fast. Where do you think you're going with those? Just send them on, like I said. No, no, you don't. You let one by last week that never should have passed. And I had the boss on my neck yesterday. You just stand there while I take a look. Stand? Well, can I sit, comrade? Oh, the boss will be here any minute. You stand. And show the proper respectful attitude, too. Hmm. And this one's in order. Yes, and this. Say, what's this? What? Right, which one? This one, not had. A farmer, landowner? Oh, that. Well, what's wrong with it? The guy only wants a radio tube. Only a radio tube. Huh. You missed the point completely. He's a Kulak. I've told you at least a hundred times. Information given by Kulaks goes on Form 96. And you send that on to Comrade Malenkoff's office. And I'm supposed to guess these things? Oh, sometimes I marvel at your stupidity. 
Sometimes I wonder why I don't get rid of you. <laughs> you want me to tell you, comrade? No, shut up. Listen, I don't propose to get in trouble on account of you. So you just watch your step. Or your number 96 may end up on Malenkoff's desk. <laughs> You are listening to Sapphire Anniversary, a story of the way things could be if communism took over, a picture of what life would be like under a communist regime in an ordinary American town, a town we call Springfield, USA. What are these, comrade? More 96 is ready to be processed. Dirty Kulak property owners, huh? They'll be processed, all right. Dan Proctor, age 68. Occupation farmer. Owner of five acres arable land, five room cottage furnished. Twelve year old black stallion, ten chickens. No listing of property in Ministry of Agriculture tax records. Mm. Impose non-production and kulak penalties. Quadruple tax. Call to the immediate attention of the office of District Commissar Conway. Oh, there's John with me looking this way. Answer it, Dan. Give me a second to powder my nose. Well, hello, folks. Oh, George. Hey, something smells pretty fine here. Put your powder puff away, Kate. It's only George. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, pardon me. Oh, it's George in a bottle of something. <laughs> yeah. Happy anniversary, Kate. Oh, I, You see, George. I was poking around the cupboard, you see, at my place, and I found this. You know, kind of thought it might, uh... Well, I thought it might make me a hug, eh, Kate? Sure, <laughs> not only a hug, but a kiss. <laughs> now, now, break it up. You, now, break it up. Now... <laughs> Say, will you look at this wine? Mm -hmm. It's from France, yeah, right here. Vintage 1935. Oh, George was oh, a yeah. man of iron nerves. How did you manage to keep from touching it all these years? Why, man, as a weak will is next, fellow, you know. Just didn't know it was there, that fellow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, George, what's new? You've been to town lately? Oh, half been to the city. The farther I keep away, the stay, the better I like it. You know, I was down to the crossroads post office just yesterday. And the news is all very bad. Conway's turned into a two-bit dictator in the best Joe Stalin tradition. If the news is bad, we don't want to hear it. Not today. Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, uh, say, is there anything I can do to help Kate? Not a thing. The two of you go on into the living room. You keep an eye out for John. Let me know when you see him coming. All right, Kate. Yeah, if you need anything, call me. <laughs> Seems like old times all the buzzing around here in the kitchen. Yeah. Hey, speaking of old times, do you remember how to carve a roast? Why, sure, sure I do. Let me see now. You cut with the grain of the meat. Yo. No. No, that doesn't sound right now, does it? Let me see now. You cut across. Or... Why, Dan, I don't rightly know. <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter. Probably John won't know the difference anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey. Somebody's coming out. Looked just like a state car. Oh, it's John. Uh, Kate, Kate, he's here. Reach for that powder puff. Hello, Dan. Oh, boy, are you welcome oh, inside. Welcome <laughs> home, Johnny. Welcome oh, home. Dad and George. It's great oh, to see you looking Johnny. so well. Yeah, hey. let's go to see you. <laughs> Johnny. Oh, Mom. Oh, Mr. Spencer, come here this minute and give Mom. me a kiss. Oh, Mom. Sugar and spice and everything. Oh, Johnny. I hope so. This came from the kitchen. And... Oh, Johnny, where's my old Where's little Johnny? Well, they couldn't make it this time, Mom. Oh, that's too bad. I've been looking forward to having them. Oh, but thank heaven you're here. Uh, <laughs> you know, Johnny, for once I've timed a dinner ride. I can sit down with the rest of you for a minute. <laughs> and in the living room, no less. Come on. Tell me, how's family, John? Oh, all in good health, George. I'm sorry they couldn't be here, but Johnny was scheduled to join a... A boys' club. Uh, maybe you can bring him for a couple of days when the school's out. Boys' club? They didn't get little Johnny in that kind of youth group. I'm afraid so. Seems to be no way out of it. George, nothing unpleasant today, please. Uh, okay, now I'm sorry. Hey, I guess I almost forgot to say happy anniversary, you <laughs> two. 
I hope Vi and I look as well and happy as you two after we've been married yeah. 45 years. Yeah, your mother is one in a million, Johnny. Well, look, look, just look at her now. Look at her. I swear she gets younger every year. Yes, she does. Oh, yes, you do. And today you do she looks drumming. just like a bride. <laughs> <laughs> come, on, come on, let's go in the kitchen. Sit down. Uh, oh, Dad, I brought that power to if you want to hear Oh, Oh, thanks, John. I really appreciate it. A little thing like that, you'd be amazed at the red tape and power. Forms, requisitions, applications. Oh. I think sometimes I spend half my life filling them up. Well, that's mm. except that's Connie technique. Uh, Kate, the table looks wonderful. Mm -hmm. Dan, will you ask some blessing? Yeah, I certainly will. Father, we thank thee for this evidence, thy bounty. We thank thee for 45 years of happiness. For our son, John, our friend, George, protect and care for Viola and little Johnny. Amen. Amen. Now... Well, who do you suppose that could be just when we're ready to eat? I better answer it, Dan. Yes, uh, you weren't expecting anyone else, were you? No. no. Well, you better start eating before it gets cold. Mm, I didn't anybody drive in, but I guess you can out here in the kitchen. Well, to start in, see, your dinner's going to be ruined. I wonder why Dan's taking so long. The rest of the family's out here at the table. Come on, come on, say hello. The Kate. Here's Paul Conway and Mr. Headley, his assistant. We've met before. Good afternoon, Mr. Conway. Mr. Headley. Uh, good afternoon, Citizen X. Proctor. This is George Morrow. This is my son, John. Oh, yes. The driver of the state car from the traffic bureau. Yes. I work in Springfield. Well, won't you both have some dinner? There's enough for two more. So I noticed. It looks very good. Surprisingly good. But, uh, we're here in a matter of business. Your taxes. In accordance with the new directive. Oh, well, so that's all. We have that saved, uh, haven't we, Kate? All $30. It happens to be considerably more. Your land tax has been increased to $120, due and payable now. Well, One, uh, $120? That can't be. It can't be. Plus the quotas you evaded the past quarter since they were put into operation by the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, read the listing, Comrade Headley. <coughs> Ministry quotas required and not met. Twelve dozen eggs, half the produce of the vegetable plot, 500 pounds of hay, 60 gallons of milk, penalties for non-production, $400. Rental of state land, $200. Current taxes, $120. Total... Seven hundred twenty dollars. Seven hundred and twenty dollars? Conway. Conway, it's impossible. You, you must know that I, I have Comrade, no. as a worker in the traffic office, I understand these matters. Seems to me you've confused my parents with someone else. They have very little, barely enough to keep themselves alive. Uh, these are the facts, as listed by the office in Springfield. Oh, uh, give me that paper, Headley, Form 96. Yes, yes. Here you are, Conway. Yes. Name... Dan Proctor, occupation farmer, owner of five acres arable land, five-room cottage furnished, 12-year-old black stallion, ten chickens. No listing of property in Ministry of Agriculture tax records. Wait, those, those, those facts, the exact wording I used. Look, Comrade Headley, how did this investigation start? This crime of tax evasion was discovered with his application for a radio tube. Crime? To want to repair a radio? Is that another new directive, Comrade? Yes, in the radio tube that started it. Comrade Proctor, the $720 is due now. Either you pay or face the consequences of default. Which is it, Comrade? I told you, I, I've got $30. Very well, you won't pay. In that case, we'll be forced to confiscate item three on your property listing, the 12-year-old black stallion. Uh, but, uh, Comrade, it's not worth 700 We'll take the horse. No, not Blackie. If you don't touch him, you hear? Without the horse, we're through. We can't till our land. There'll be nothing to eat, surely. You, you can see that. And besides, Black Blackie's like one of the... Family. I have no choice in the matter. I am a servant of the state. As such, I'm here to discharge a duty delegated to me by the state. But you don't have to condemn them to death. They can't get along without the horse. These people may be your parents. But from the viewpoint of the state, 
They are capitalist landowners of the Kulak class. They have no legal standing. Conway, as a worker for the state... We're have... all workers for the state. Or should be. Headley, go get that horse. Oh, yes, yes, Conway. No, you don't. You'll have to kill me first. Stand then. aside, Citizen Proctor. Get you pause off that... Point. I warn you, Proctor, interfering with an official is a crime against the state. All right, I'm a criminal. Go ahead, Comrade Headley, get the horse. The rest of you, you'll all be held as witnesses. Proctor assaulted an agent of the state. Comrade John Proctor, you will testify that the seizure of the horse is legal. Otherwise, your official career may be interrupted. John, get some water. Cold water. Yes, Dan, Dan, your head's cut. Here, I'll hold him. A little cold water, Mr. Farrell. Where is he? Blackie, uh, help me up. The other one, Headley. He's after Blackie. Johnny, you've got to stop no him. No one leaves. You'll all stay in this room. Johnny, there's nothing I can do to... Well, then I can. Dan, wait! Doctor, stop! Stop where you are. I'll shoot the first one who steps off this porch. Conway, please, please, I want you to listen to me. Oh, hold it! Oh, Conway, Conway, put yourself in my place. Maybe then you'll see. Have you a pet, Mr. Conway, a dog or a cat you're fond of? Yes, yes, a pet. You see, we love Blackie that way, only more so. He's part of us. He's part of the family. Then, just take him, Blackie. Oh, please, Mr. Conway, please. Conway, Conway, you can't. You can't. Stay Conway. where you are, Proctor. No, 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 no. Look at it this way, Conway. I'm not strong. I can't make a living without that horse. Conway, Conway, even you communists use the term comrade. As a comrade, you can't deprive me of my life. Conway, we're two human beings. We can live together as brothers. We each have our rights. There is only one human right. The privilege of serving the state. Thanks to you, comrade. We won't be serving for long. You have just heard a story of what happens to the little fellow under a communist regime. You have just heard what would happen to any American family if communism took over. You think this could not happen? It did happen in the town of Salsk in Russia. It did happen to the family of a farmer named Vazya Golovachi. Because of non-payment of taxes, the communists took from the Golovachis the one thing that kept them alive, their cow and thereby condemn them to death. You've been listening to If Freedom Failed, starring John Daner and Peggy Weber as Dan and Kate Proctor in Sapphire Anniversary. Music was composed by Earl Lawrence with musical direction by Michelle Perrier. Sapphire Anniversary was written for If Freedom Failed by William Tunberg, produced and directed by Robert M. Young. Sergeant Lloyd Iyer speaking. This program has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.